Okay, so, uh, well, thank you so much, Charlotte, for the introduction and uh, also for um, uh, hosting me together with Suzanne. And thank you for the Auerbach Institute for this uh, uh, offering of the fellowship, which allowed me to think and rethink about my work at the intersection of, on, of uh, art and the political economy. So uh, the title of the of the of this lecture is uh, on communist art and the labor of the anarchist, which goes back to a definition that Alan Capro, uh, an artist himself, uh, gave to what he thought would be the aim of art uh, in the 1970s and 80s, which would be really to uh, set the model of uh, society where labor could be free, labor could be creative and in a way to set also the direction of, uh, let's say, a society beyond capitalism. And uh, uh, that discussion about, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the future of a society in which labor is uh, creative, in which everybody is an artist, was somehow also the kind of utopia that Marx and Engels were writing about uh, when they were writing about the communist society. So they were given a big... Uh, sort of a big role to the artists and to art in general. And myself, I've been working uh, both in practice and through my scholarship to try to understand what is the role of art in uh, uh, prefiguring, in imagining uh, worlds, uh, let's say, beyond capitalism or a post-capitalist world, which we will discuss more about this notion of post-capitalism as well. Um, and I start with a, a, a sort of an anecdote from my fieldwork in Brazil. Uh, this is uh, the Compañía Siderúrgica Nacional, which is the biggest steel complex in Latin America, where I spent uh, on and off 10 years between 2008 and 2018. The company owns not only the, uh, the, the company town, but owns also uh, the forest around, and it's the biggest urban forest in Brazil after the Foresta de Tijuca in Rio. Um, and I was living on the edge uh, between the, the, the plant and the forest uh, in a, a space that was uh, full of, uh, let's say, plots that were completely hidden from the company at the edge of this uh, uh, Atlantic forest that were quite invisible. Um, and one day, towards the beginning of my fieldwork, there was um, a, 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 an advertisement for a, a commercial brand, and they decided to shoot uh, this adver advertisement precisely in that place with the, you know, the, the dramatic backdrop of the forest. Um, and it was really a commercial, uh, like it was a Nike advertisement, actually. And, uh, but from that advertisement, the police kind of came. They thought there was a real demonstration. Well, the advertisement was showing a demonstration. They thought there was a real demonstration. And then the, the, there was a real confrontation. And from the confrontation, it kind of escalated. And so the residents came, and, and there was a real fight. And uh, some people were taken to the police. Um, and from that, I kind of, uh, uh, the reason why I'm saying this, because uh, what I'm really interested in is that, that kind of spaces that art can create in which, uh, it's not really clear what's going on. It's not really clear what kind of uh, situation is happening. It's not really clear what kind of space we are inhabiting. And, uh, and also, uh, is a moment in which somehow uh, these kind of movements, uh, this kind of social pattern, social interaction can be captured in different ways. And the artist can be actually the person that, that let's say, captures these forms, these, these patterns, and uh, creates a reality that somehow uh, can kind of bend a little bit what we are experiencing. So uh, I talk about commons uh, uh, and the notion of commons. We can also discuss this uh, means several things, but I talk really about the commons, uh, the historical commons. So the commons that were existing, uh, well, this is Britain in the uh, 17th century. Uh, the commons were basically common land where uh, peasants could live uh, out of a subsistence economy and linked to common lands was also a social order that was very much uh, egalitarian, was also relying on a specific kind of knowledge that was uh, 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 also, let's say, reproduced very much to women and uh, revolving around this kind of uh, matriarchal or women-based uh, uh, communities. Uh, 1604 is the date when the, the parliament decided that uh, uh, land could be enclosed by act of parliament. And that created a huge shift in the economy of England, which led, of course, to 
the privatization of the land, and a, a series of notions like pro private property, which didn't exist before, uh, such as the productivity of labor. And so this kind of shift uh, really led to a massive transformation in which not only people <coughs> produced and lived, uh, but also the way in which people thought about themselves as productive individuals whose value was based on labor. Uh, and of course, we know that um, legally, uh, slowly, the people who could own, the people who could vote, were the people who were able to labor. And so that also entailed a kind of distinction between men and women. Uh, at the same time in which uh, the enclosure were happening in England, uh, uh, there were, uh, of course, the plantation economy was uh, uh, evolving and developing in Brazil. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, the movements was one of uh, capturing land, enclosing land, and uh, uh, creating these forms of uh, uh, forced labor. Of course, we're talking about plantation economy, we're talking about also some kind of racialized system where uh, labor was extracted also according to uh, a logic really of violence. And this is a quilombo that is very famous. The quilombos are uh, communities of slaves, of runaway slaves, who uh, basically created these societies that were very la much like commons, where societies that were completely horizontal, uh, where uh, there were several ethnicities, because the plantation economy was relying on uh, people from different ethnicities, uh, and where, let's say, uh, uh, the economy was kind of parasitical on uh, uh, the economy of the plantation, but was also a very much autonomous and self-managed economy. So uh, this notion of the commons, I'm trying to uh, really, uh, through my kind of historical work, but also through my uh, work of, uh, let's say, engaging practices of commoning, uh, this notion of commons continue to resonate with uh, the way in which also artists and the early modernist avant-garde thought about their art as being revolutionary or being socially progressive. But of course, we are talking at first about uh, revolution, revolutionary art. This is one of my horrible uh, watercolors that I do when I teach uh, my economic anthropology, and it kind of sets up a little bit the framework, the theoretical framework of uh, of my work. So uh, the issue is really looking at the, uh, let's say, uh, forms of uh, ins the institution, the modern institution, especially capitalist institution, as form of enclosures. A uh, form of enclosure of movements, of life in movement, that creates some kind of ossification, some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, freezing of reality in the forms of objects, in the form of uh, uh, subjects, in the form of uh, uh, museums. And in fact, the, the important thing is that uh, uh, not only uh, economy uh, as a system of knowledge, but also as a series of practices, but also art as a, a form of practices and uh, a, a way of uh, thinking about human action or, uh, let's say, human value, uh, is a parallel system that reinforces the system of the economy. And so together with the enclosure of the factory, we have the enclosure of the museum. Together with the invention of the commodity, we have the invention of the artwork. And so, in a way, this framework, which is kind of an anthropological framework, doesn't come from art history or from economics, is a really a way of looking at the kind of the different orders, the different rationalities or the different logics through which humanity feels that they have to enclose things in objects or in spaces. But also the counter-movements, so the movements of the commons are somehow movements of liberations of these enclosures. Um, and so uh, life in movements, uh, this idea of the cosmos in movement, was really what animated the early avant-garde. Uh, and of course, was also what animated Taylorism, what animated also the Industrial Revolution. This idea that uh, human beings were transmitter or tra you know, uh, 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 this transmitter belt of this kind of energy that was the energy of the universe, this kind of energy that was electrodynamic, uh, was chemical, was... Uh, a really uh, kind of complex uh, 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 sets of uh, uh, physical and chemical uh, uh, energy. And, and that, of course, the notion of craft was invented in the 19th century. It was really the, the idea of energy. Craft, I mean, in German, actually, means energy. And so the notion of labor theory was really about controlling this energy that human beings as workers uh, were conveying through uh, the mechanical system. But uh, the early uh, uh, avant-garde also were looking at liberating, using this energy to liberate the humanity. 
And Fedorov, uh, Fedorov, Nikolai Fedorov, was one of the early cosmists who looked at the Museum of the Future as an immense membrane that would permeate uh, the whole of humanity. And the aim of the Museum of the Future is really to improve the lives of humanity, so much so to even uh, try to uh, develop the kind of immortality and to resurrect the dead. So the aim of cosmism was really to uh, use this energy not so much to connect to the future as a, for the futurist, but to connect to the past, to, to connect to the ancestral past, to uh, recreate this uh, unity between present and past generation. But the idea was uh, also uh, of this invisible community or this invisible commoning or in commons between different generations. And uh, uh, this was also the aim of uh, Malevich, was uh, the, the, the revolutionary art was uh, an attempt to show what was not visible, the, in, the invisible, an attempt to show what really could not be captured in the institution of the museum, in the institution of the painting, or in the object of the painting. And so the idea of revolutionary art is to create a, a, the space of non-representation. The idea of revolutionary, uh, the revolutionary museum is uh, the absence of museum. Uh, and of course, uh, here you can see the paradox of art in the sense that art can try to uh, you know, uh, can try to overcome representation, but in the end, it, uh, you can see the cracks of the paints on, on the surface, and so uh, it's impossible to uh, represent the, uh, the invisible. And Irma Flint was also another artist who was looking at the invisible, that was looking at these kind of patterns of uh, uh, psychical or cosmic energy, uh, and she was doing that through her own community of friends and women through which, uh, let's say, they, uh, she uh, experimented this kind of access to uh, the invisible. Um, the avant-garde uh, uh, of the, let's say, 19, 1920s, especially surrealist, were really using art as a, a tool to uh, deconstruct and to criticize Western society <coughs> at the time of uh, uh, post-First World War in which uh, uh, Europe was, uh, uh, you know, had kind of been uh, following in a, a path that was really very dangerous. Um, and so the surrealists were, uh, the surrealist artists suddenly tried to think about how through their labor, uh, through the, uh, let's say, uh, practices, they could start to undo some of the assumption that capitalist society had about the role of the artist. So here, the notion of labor of the artist become really central. And with the found object, the champ wanted to uh, ask, uh, you know, what, 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 what is, you know, what is the value of the labor of the artist once the artist stop producing things, uh, stop become the author of the commodity, but is simply someone who found an object and put it in, in, a, in a museum. And so this idea that the artist could actually, uh, art could be a laboratory to rethink the categories, but also the practices of capitalist society. Um, and uh, uh, much of this, uh, uh, let's say, utopia were also utopia that were trying to link uh, the individual and the collective in relationship to technology by using technology that would uh, lead society to, uh, uh, in a way, reconcile uh, individual life, the life in the family, with the life of the collective. But there was also the idea of uh, this kind of organic uh, uh, mode of life. This idea that, uh, for instance, this single capsule could fly uh, in the air, could go into the ocean, could live under the water. So there was this idea also that technology could bring humanity in contact with nature as well, in a, a kind of organic a planetary state. Um, but slowly also the artists started to understand that instead of being only, uh, let's say, uh, closed in their offices, art should be going out into society and uh, uh, try to intervene in the condition of existence of people. And uh, the Agitprop van, like all the Agitprop, let's say, uh, methodology, was really about uh, uh, trying to change the uh, material conditions of people, educating people in the street, um, and so having a kind of material impact on society. So the notion of the commons, uh, uh, let's say, uh, it was very important, as I was saying in the beginning, when we were talking about the enclosure. Uh, it was kind of inspiring communism or communism uh, in the 19th century, but also in the right from Marx. And then it went a little bit silent because obviously the commons was uh, 
what uh, industrial capital was the nation state destroyed in the sense that the nation state started to be uh, relying on these two realms the realms of the public and the realm of the pub and the private the public and the private were two inventions of the nation state and so the common disappeared in the moments in which the nation state and, and, and the, the welfare economy linked to the nation state and all the social system and all that was linked to this uh, were, were in place. And so the disappearance of the common uh, also uh, it's, it's a small, like, represents a small time in history, if you want, uh, from the end of this kind of communist imagination to uh, uh, the end of, uh, uh, let's say, Fordism of, or uh, in corporate capitalism, which I described more here. And this is a, a kind of pivotal time. Uh, the man goes to the moon, 1969. This is a, a cover that I really like a lot be for two reasons. I mean, first, because it was written a few days after I was born. And uh, so much, I'm a child of the moon. Um, but also because in this specific issue, uh, there is an article in this issue uh, by an anthropologist called Marsha Salins, who was writing in this, uh, uh, precisely in this article, in this issue, that uh, was writing about a, a, a tribe of uh, uh, hunter and gatherers who uh, were nomadic, and he was describing this uh, tribe of hunter and gatherers as the perfect anti capitalist society. And so the idea was that this uh, nomadic lifestyle was anti capitalist because it was about, you know, was, was, was about contesting the notion of continuous growth, continuous production, uh, the idea of uh, needs, scarcity. In fact, they were really uh, pretty happy not working at all. Their diet was very healthy. And they were basically representing this you know, ideal small-scale society. Um, and so it's, it's really peculiar that at the time in which you know, humanity goes to the moon, in the same space there is a humanity that actually is stuck in the desert in a very small a hunter and gathering situation of, uh, of self subsistence. And so, in a way, this kind of uh, schizophrenic moment in which, uh, uh, you know, extreme abstraction and also extreme, you know, extreme kind of uh, 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 desire really for groundedness uh, happens uh, in the 1960s. And this is a time in which the commons comes out, precisely this uh, notion of uh, self determination of small scale communities, small scale organizations. And it's also the time in which uh, 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 this uh, uh, happened uh, and this discourse about uh, horizontality, autonomy, creativity is a discourse that is pushed very much by the uh, youth movement, by the cultural movement, by the you know, anti-state movement. And, and this is also a theme that Boltaski and Ciappello uh, stress in their book, The New Spirit of Capitalism, that was precisely this um, moment of cultural revolution in which uh, the state was criticized because it was too bureaucratic, too rationalistic. Corporate capitalism was criticized because it was uh, completely unsustainable. Uh, this emphasis on autonomy, creativity, organization, self-organization was also was what led a new cultural shift in capitalism that led to the kind of small-scale flexible capitalism that informed you know, the kind of Silicon Valley capitalism. Of course, this was also a structural moment because uh, uh, it was a crisis of Fordism that was cre created by the oil crisis, by uh, the pressure from the labor movement, but also the decolonizing, uh, decolonizing forces that started to reject uh, the expansion of uh, industry abroad. Um, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, uh, maybe uh, quickly go through this, but basically trying to say that in the 70s, Autonomous uh, 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 cultural organizations were very important in crafting a new wave of artists that were uh, very critical both of state, uh, uh, let's say art, or museum, public museum, but also very critical of the market. Uh, 1971, the kitchen was an incredible autonomous space where uh, you know, Andy Warhol, uh, Yvonne Rayner, and this is uh, uh, an important, very important space in Belgrade. Uh, which was very central for uh, criticizing the new form of kind of state, uh, let's say, um, the state bourgeoisie, but also the kind of uh, 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 mixture of uh, capitalism and communism was seeping into Yugoslavia. 
So uh, we, this is the start of uh, the artist as a, an entrepreneur. And so the artist start to actually uh, become uh, directly involved in uh, uh, um, projects of uh, economic change, of economic redistribution. Uh, a famous intervention of Joseph Boyce at Documenta, he planted 7,000 oaks, uh, but also this was a part of a broader project that he was leading uh, about sustainable agriculture that was uh, starting to spread around Italy, around Germany, and I saw him involved in the founding of the Green Party in Germany. Uh, his idea of sustainable agriculture was again very much uh, linked to this kind of idea of uh, uh, kind of psychic energy that we would uh, get from the earth, from the contact with the earth, but also from circular kinds of economy that would uh, come back to humanity and regenerate it. Um, it also the moment in which uh, uh, artists start to develop this uh, relational aesthetic uh, or this kind of relational art where suddenly uh, it is becomes kind of uh, uh, central uh, for artists to create this kind of social gathering that are impermanent, that we don't really know if they are art or they are uh, parties. And uh, the Thai artist, Rikriti Ravanilla, was quite famous because he was throwing big parties, big lunches, was cooking for the public in the museum. And so, but that was started a big shift in art because uh, art started to imagine the common in this kind of uh, very impermanent, very leisure-oriented way. Uh, and so the idea was to imagine this, like the, the, the political side of this uh, 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 art was... Uh, to refuse any kind of identification with class discourse, with discourse of social change, of big narrative of revolution. The idea is that here, uh, gathering were impermanent, were based on, on, on some kind of chance encounters, and you actually, you had to adapt to each other uh, in a way that uh, was uh, flexible and was uh, uh, apparently uh, quite uh, democratic, or if not uh, um, life-changing. Uh, so this relational art morphed in different kinds of uh, 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 sort of uh, version. This was a giant uh, slide that uh, Carsten Holler put at the Tate Modern. This idea uh, of participatory art where the public started to actually become involved in these games uh, together with the artist. Um, more importantly, there was a, a new uh, generation of artists who started to uh, be part of the urban regeneration of uh, the cities. And uh, uh, starting from this project, like Rick Lowe, who was a scholar of uh, Susan Lacey, another artist that was really important in her work in Auckland, um, basically it was a project of recuperation of uh, this uh, uh, slave uh, uh, architecture. <laughs> Uh, and um, which the artist turned into residencies for black artists and uh, uh, low and kind of housing for low income black families. Uh, the the artist got involved with the municipality uh, in project in financial project in kind of planning financially with the municipality and actually this economic involvement turned this uh, artistic intervention into a business and uh, uh, also turned this area into a very kind of uh, gentrified middle-class area, so creating a lot of problems within the community itself. And in a way, is this kind of uh, relationship between gentrification and art uh, project that uh, started to be very central uh, to the notion of uh, activism, or the art activism in the 1990s, in the 2000s, so this was another struggle against gentrification of the port area where two artists start to involve the local residents into planning through forms of kind of creative uh, games or creative coming together. Uh, Susan Lacey, uh, this is a project uh, that lasted 10 years in Auckland, uh, a very beautiful project that was, uh, the aim was to uh, basically uh, give to um, to give to uh, women, young women of the black community, the skills to survive in uh, a neighborhood that was characterized by violence, by police brutality. And so this was a 10 years long uh, project of training uh, liter in liter media literacy, in self-defense, 
uh, where she actually uh, did develop a proper uh, um, curriculum uh, for uh, these kind of interventions. Um, so uh, art, uh, the art has started to get involved politically in uh, the 2000, 2010, uh, was also an art that was responding to this new kind of, uh, 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 let's say, forms of gathering uh, in the city, forms of city occupation, like Occupy, and of course the uh, so-called uh, revolution uh, of the square. And so uh, slowly uh, in 2010, there was a big shift in the uh, power that organization had in redefining the economy of cities. And this is because uh, the shift, of course, of the global economy, especially in the West, from industrial to post-industrial, meant that uh, museum, cultural organization, tourism became the main motors of cities. And this is where, uh, when David Harvey was uh, writing his book, Rebel Cities, saying that actually there was this shift, historical shift, uh, that led uh, cultural organization to become really powerful, but also to self-determine what is, a cult what, is a, what is culture, and to self-manage what is culture. Um, and so the idea of artivism, of art activism, developed uh, uh, spread uh, around, uh, uh, the, say, let's say, the art world. We don't know if this is real art or is uh, just activi activism. We don't know if this is real activism or it's just, uh, you know, moments in which uh, this performance happened and then uh, uh, they kind of get lost and uh, maybe they get recuperated in some, you know, uh, publication in some kind of advertisement. But this is also the point I'm trying to make, that art is also a process that by entering into politics, by trying to, uh, let's say, coalescing politics in some kind of art artistic output, often uh, still authorial, uh, it's a mechanism that often, let's say, uh, either aestheticizes politics or, uh, let's say, r makes it, uh, uh, in a way, blocks uh, the moment uh, of uh, political activism or kind of uh, in in processes that become actually counterproductive. Anyway, this is the idea of the useful art, uh, art that is involved in activism that Tania Bruguera developed. She's a Cuban artist, very well known. She comes from a background of art and activism from Latin America, where actually artists were real uh, activists in the sense that they had to operate against, uh, or uh, let's say in the, in the shadow of uh, a state that was very uh, repressive. And so all these are issue of artist activism really come out from the tradition of anti-dictatorship uh, in Argentina, in Brazil, uh, forms like the Invisible Theater of Augusto Boal, where really artists try to do strange uh, actions in public so that they could undo, uh, you know, the order that was imposed by the state. Um, and so 2010 is a moment of, uh, uh, like David Harvey was saying, the moment in which uh, uh, the economy of cities started to shift, the, the political balance of, uh, of uh, uh, urban politics started to shift. And these are the big occupations that happened in Italy, in Spain, in uh, Greece. Uh, artists occupy their institutions and start to self-manage them. Uh, it was also the moment that coincided with the, uh, you know, the self-management of the uh, companies in Argentina. So mm -hmm. self-management started to become a model that characterized uh, the art world that is also taken from the self-management uh, that happens in areas of uh, extreme crisis in the global south. The important change uh, in Italy was that uh, um, the occupation in Italy happened after the referendum of the water that the, uh, Berlusconi tried to pass in 2011 to privatize the water. He lost terribly, that 90% of people wanted to keep it national. And so lawyers at that time uh, realized they could actually apply the, the nationalization of, uh, uh, you know, the law nationalization of the water to culture. And so they passed a, a law that modified the constitution and that basically legalized occupation such as this. So occupation uh, uh, spread throughout Italy and, um, and uh, that's not, uh, in, and the commons became not so much an alternative to the state, but a way of uh, creating a different form of relationship between uh, uh, autonomous space in cities and, this, and, this, and, uh, and the state. 
these are all organizations that are part of this Institute of Radical Imagination that I, uh, I will talk later if I have time or in the conversation. Um, and this was the time when I founded uh, the, uh, I, this, um, I was director of the Athens Biennale. And so that was the time in which uh, Athens was uh, uh, basically in the grip of uh, a complete uh, absence of state. Uh, Greece was, uh, you know, undergoing these austerity measures uh, that we know. There was 50% unemployment, uh, hospital, uh, schools were closed. Uh, and in, instead of the state, there were this kind of solidarity organization that was managing everything. There were solidarity schools, solidarity clinics, uh, solidarity lawyers. Um, and there were also enabled organizations that were kind of uh, linking all these uh, uh, structures. And so with the Biennale, I, I tried to turn uh, the institution of the Biennale that normally is like, a, is like an art institution. It's just, some, you know, it's just for two years you commission artists, you make a program in the usual way in which you create a, a car, you know, you, you would produce a car, like, you know, you create a commodity. Whereas with the idea of the Biennale was that uh, I would first involve all these organizations that were already out there, including rural cooperatives, including hackers, peer-to-peer groups, in the uh, planning and uh, in the making of uh, uh, the Biennale, but also in commissioning artists who would be willing to actually work with the Biennale on this issue of austerity for two years. We commissioned uh, Susan Lacey came to work with us, Tiesta Gates, a lot of famous artists who actually were really uh, interested in uh, working for no money but uh, for a project uh, such as this. This was the building that we uh, occupied is in the center of Athens. We, it's a huge, uh, wonderful neoclassical building in the center, which we clean, we put solar panels, and we invited uh, artists to live in. And this is how it started the Biennale with the General Assembly where we decided uh, the, uh, the, the direction of the Biennale. Um, I want to just say incidentally that that was also the year when Documenta was uh, in Athens. And so there was a big uh, clash of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, visions between Documenta and the Athens Biennale. Um, and so now we are at a different moment in which museums are not anymore supporting cultural organization. I mean, I have to say, uh, to, to, to not clarify that that moment of, uh, let's say, militant organization, the moment that, that, that uh, David Harvey called rebel cities, but also made possible because museums were involved very heavily in supporting social uh, uh, centers and, and occupations. So Reina Sofia, uh, Macba in Barcelona, they were all museums that were supporting militant organization and that uh, this, this kind of uh, coalition led also to the formation of uh, you know, Podemos, Syriza. And so there was a real a moment in which actually art uh, institution could make a difference. Um, but that changed and uh, we know that uh, uh, the kind of a, a, a general right, right uh, switch in municipality, but also uh, there was a, 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 a kind of popular uh, um, reaction towards these militant museums that were often public. And so the idea is, you know, you're, you're using public money to do politics and in a way uh, you know, how can you be accountable? And, and so the idea, you know, the commons as well was, was started to be perceived as something that a minority of people wanted, whereas museums should be public. Um, and so the institutional museum also, because of the decolonial, decolonial conversation, started to be problematic. And instead of talking about the sort of radical museum, as Claire Bishop talks about, uh, we are talking about abolitionism and so how you can turn a museum in a kind of uh, uh, in, in, a, in a decolonial museum. These are my friends uh, decolonize this place who have been, have been doing a, a, a work of uh, uh, let's say opposition to the museum since the, the time of the Guggenheim and now with the MoMA. Uh, so decolonization meant that either you change the museum or as an artist, you do something uh, abroad in the Global South in collaboration with communities in the Global South. This is Renzo Martin, who basically set up 
a, a, a community of uh, makers in Congo. Um, and this is uh, another of my uh, watercolors, and it's an Institute of Radical Imagination, and it's, it's uh, the, the, uh, the basic institution I set up with uh, this uh, series of uh, museums, uh, Reina Sofia, Magpa, uh, Salt, and uh, uh, this social, um, let's say, a group of social activists that uh, uh, I showed before. Um, and some scholars, uh, such as myself, were interested to actually use uh, uh, this uh, uh, collective to push towards post-capitalist imaginaries, but also policies. And so we are working very much with the economy uh, in, in sort of practical terms, but also in terms of uh, uh, creating an art that is inspired by visions of uh, uh, society beyond capitalism. So in terms of, um, of what we do, we do a sort of empirical project. And as I was saying, I was an economist, so I'm, I am very uh, always uh, uh, excited to try to put in practice uh, economic policies or, or, or projects uh, through art practices. So, so I kind of experiment them uh, practically through these projects. And so we have created, for instance, uh, forms of demoni demonetization of the economy, we can talk more uh, using, you know, blockchains, uh, and cryptocurrencies, DAOs, peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Um, we have uh, experimented, obviously, in ways of working between us, uh, in which uh, we don't pay what we do, or we pay according to a logic that it's uh, uh, internal to our organization. And then we have used, uh, there are a few lawyers that have been working on, in Naples on legalizing the common that are working for us in trying to legalize uh, uh, commons uh, uh, around the area where we operate. So we operate in Italy, Greece, Egypt, uh, and uh, uh, St. Petersburg. And, um, and so, for instance, one of the things we did was uh, we uh, um, legalized the uh, kind of uh, degree that uh, solidarity school give to migrants. And so these degrees usually not counted by the state. By by formally recognizing it, uh, the migrants can have a migrant status, uh, sorry, a resident status, and so they can stay. And so there was one, you know, little legal, let's say, uh, uh, operation we did. And then we did, we work a lot with care. We work with care workers. Uh, that was before the pandemic, but also uh, after uh, the pandemic. Uh, so the idea is also to think about uh, post-capitalism uh, in terms of uh, uh, epistemology or in terms of really thinking about the economy. Uh, and so uh, the idea of uh, um, post-capitalism by Gibson Graham is very central. And so the, the notion that capitalism is not actually, we are not living actually in a, in a, in a, in a condition of fully, full capitalism. We are living in a condition of diverse economy in which uh, commons coexist with capitalism, is cooperative coexist with capitalism. So we are living in a hybrid mode of production, let's say. Um, and we don't need the big revolutions, but we need just to push what is already existing uh, and to enlarge, let's say, to push the space of commoning within capitalism. And then there is also the issue of temporality and the issue of geography. And so commons, really, uh, it's not necessarily about uh, discovering or producing the new, uh, but it's about also reevaluating what is already there. And this is part, you know, part of the indigenous, uh, let's say, movements of indigenous knowledge is really to reconnect with practices, historical practices, ancestral practices that already exist. And so, for instance, we do intervention in uh, south of Italy, uh, or in indigenous Australia, where city had been depopulated, town had been depopulated. So we are trying to think about, you know, what kind of traditional agriculture can we go back to? Uh, is there any memory of the traditional patterns of agriculture, the traditional seeds? Uh, and so uh, there is also this issue of, uh, you know, not, not necessarily producing new uh, fancy stuff, but looking for what is already there. Um, and there is also the geographical uh, issue too, because uh, one of the things that happens, uh, I think, very much in the art world is that we, you know, there are kind of these kind of buzzwords, these kind of uh, keywords that go around, 
And so, you know, when it becomes decoloniality, you suddenly say, okay, we have to shift, you know, we have to shift, we have to look at the global south. Um, whereas it's always a kind of dialectic, it's, it's always a kind of complex inter interlinked system. And so commons, you know, have been existed for a long time uh, across, across, uh, across the world. It's, it's, it's a planetary issue also in relationship to, obviously, um, the current discussion, you know, about ecology. So um, I guess I, I want to leave it here. I just um, want to say that with this uh, uh, conversation with the, uh, Suzanne and Charlotte, my, my, uh, my uh, host, uh, I am very interested to go back to thinking uh, about common in, in relationship to the work that anthropologists have been doing for a long time. Uh, because one of the things I've always inspired my practice and that drove me towards anthropology was precisely to leave behind, you know, the theoretical world of economics uh, and, uh, and to get involved in uh, ethnography, which is really a practice of, uh, you know, producing knowledge, but also producing, you know, commoning or being in commons. And so I thank also our Buck Institute for giving me the chance for this conversation with my host. Thank you.